Hello, my name is R. Shelgen Morrison. I'm an Associate Professor of Modern Japanese Literature at Nagoya University of Foreign Studies. In this video, I'm going to be doing a recitation of J. Rubin's translation, brilliant translation of Natsume Soseki's famous speech called Watakushi no Kojin Shugi, which Soseki delivered to uh, a group of students at the uh, Gakushuin uh, or Peers College, I think it's translated as, in 1914, just three years before his death. Um, this is probably the most famous and the most often quoted of Natsume Soseki's works of nonfiction, and I'm going to read the entire speech. But before I do so, I'm going to give you nine study guide questions to think about. You will have a study guide uh, with you, and I have I will provide links to J. Rubin's translation, uh, annotated translation, uh, which includes an introduction. I'll pr provide the link to that. It's available online via JSTOR. And I'll also provide a link to the uh, original Japanese text of this speech prov uh, made available via um, Aozora, Aozora Bunko online. All right, I have an introduction to Natsume Soseki and his works um, on your study guide. I'm not going to read that here because he's such a major figure, arguably the most important writer of the first half of the 20th century in Japan. And we've already read several of his works in this class, and you will note that there are uh, sort of overlaps and similarities in th thematic similarities uh, between those works and this speech that he gave in 1914 to a group of elite kids at the elite Gakushuin uh, College. All right. Now, here are the nine questions that I want you to keep in mind as we read this speech. Okay, question number one. Describe the setting and the context of this speech. How does the who is the audience, right? And how does the setting and the audience affect the content, right? There's a lot of repetition, meandering. It's kind of disorganized. He uh, includes anecdotes about Nakugo and from Nakugo and several other anecdotes. Uh, he apologizes for being boring. There's a long introduction before the he gets into the main part of the speech and so forth, right? So how does the setting, the context, the situation affect the content, and how might this be a uh, the content of the speech be different if he had given it not to these elite kids at Gakushuin who will one day become the sort of rulers of Japan and uh, uh, the sort of main members of the ruling class but if he had given it to a group of s poor kids in the provinces for example right so his the content of the speech is um, is kind of uh, is um, hold on I lost my place here or the content is kind of tailor-made for these kids at this gakushuin. Number two, question number two. Describe the personality of Soseki, uh, or the speaker. Obviously, the, so the speaker is Soseki, but he's kind of, uh, there's a performative aspect to this, um, to his talk. So uh, we might want to make a distinction between Natsume Soseki himself, the man, and the speaker who's giving this talk to the kids. So I'll refer to him hereafter as the speaker. So note, uh, his personality, his self-deprecating humor, for example, his disposition, his sense of humor, his health situation that he alludes to in several uh, instances, uh, and so forth. His kind of hints of imposter syn syndrome that he felt when he was uh, a younger man, uh, his struggles with anxiety, and of uh, se this general sense that he was living a kind of inauthentic life when he was younger. Talk about all these aspects of his character and personality. And do you find any similarities with other Soseki narrators or protagonists that we find in any of Soseki's novels, right? For example, in Bochan and so forth. All right, question number three. How does Soseki characterize his experience abroad in England? Okay, there are several Soseki uh, works in which he discusses his... Uh, more or less unpleasant experience that he had while studying as an elite uh, foreign abroad student in, in London. Uh, and he mentions that experience here. How does he describe it? What was the source of the emptiness and the gloom and the anxiety? The, quote, vague, disagreeable, half-formed thing that would not let me alone that he felt. So what is the source of this? Where is it coming from? And what is the one thing that dispels it? His, uh, quote, only hope for salvation, right? And I'll give you a hint, his o only hope for salvation, as he writes in this uh, speech, is his fashioning for myself a conception of what literature is, to build anew the foundations of literature, right? So this is kind of life project that he discovers and that uh, kind of dispels or at least alleviates some of the uh, gloom and the anxiety that he feels. And question four is an extension of that. 
Why had his previous studies and educational experiences failed to answer this question about the essence of literature? Right, so as he notes in the speech, he took a bunch of classes in literature at uh, in, while in London, and nobody really explained to him what literature exactly is. Right, and he had the same experience while in Japan, so he he decided uh, to come up with his own highly personalized uh, original account of what of the essence of literature. Right, and he wrote his famous Bungakudong, which was translated a few years ago uh, into English by Professor Boda. I'll put the link to that in the description below as well, uh, so we can read that if we haven't read it already. Uh, from this speech, what can we glean about the speaker's view of the essence of art and the essence of literature? Note that he, is, he describes his book, The Bungakurong, which he published seven years before making this speech, uh, Theory of Literature, Bungakurong, and he describes it in this speech as not so much a memorial to my projected life's work as its corpse, and a deformed corpse at that. All right, so he kind of he might be uh, just displaying uh, humility here, but he might actually regard that work as a kind of failure, a failure to account for the uh, essence of literature. Uh, question number five: What paradigms of East versus West, right, uh, Japan versus England, for example, does he set up in this speech? Does he believe there are fundamental irreconcilable uh, Weltbild or world picture differences between the civilizational blocks, right? Civilizational block of, of uh, Sinocentric East Asia, for example, versus the West. Are the uh, differences between these blocks of civilizations irreconcilable? Or does he see some kind of ground for, or the possibility for some kind of common ground or universalism? All right, so explain uh, that uh, issue in your answer to question number five. Question number six. What does he mean when he says he has recently transitioned from other-centered to self-centered? These are two words that he uses. How does his translation, his transition from other-centered to self-centered relate to his personal quest for the foundations of literature? All right, so it's not just as if he was living for others early in his life and now he's decided to live for himself and do whatever he pleases. Uh, on the contrary, it relates directly to his... Um, project of uh, kind of getting to the bottom of this uh, question, what is the essence of literature? And what effect does this shift to ego-centeredness, jiko hong yi is the word he uses in the original, have on his anxiety-ridden, gloomy self, right? So in some uh, measure, he's able to dispel his anxiousness and his gloominess and his um, depression by embarking on this project, this ego-centered project of uh, exploring the foundations of literature. Okay, and this speech is divided into two sections, part one and part two. Uh, these next three questions relate to the second part. Discuss Soseki's nuanced and dialectical view of individualism, right? So he's not a gung-ho advocate for individualism, nor is he a criti uh, staunch critic of individualism who kind of denounces it as um, getting in the way of Japanese nationalism or Japanese essence and so forth. All right, so discuss his nuanced and dialectical view. What does he see as individualism's merits? What does he see as its dis demerits? Note that he is just as critical of those who advocate unrestrained self-assertion, as he puts it, right? Uh, in other words, those who overvalue individuality and the inclinations at the expense of duty and ethical culture. Uh, he doesn't mention names here, but we might uh, recall, for example, the egoist Iwano Hōme, who's a prominent figure in the literary world, who kind of espoused a Nietzschean uh, celebration of self and said, to hell with everybody else, right? So he's just as critical of that camp of people as he is of the ultra-nationalists who denounce individualism tout court, okay? And he mentioned several names here, I think, of the ultra-nationalists who write uh, essays in their uh, ultra-nationalist magazines about how terrible individualism is, how it's a foreign concept, and how it's destroying the uh, Japanese race and so forth. Right, so he's critical of both extreme camps. Also note how he contrasts what he calls ethical individuality with selfish individuality on the one hand and also with feudal cliques and mob thinking on the other. Okay, So he's not advocating individuality per se in this essay. Keep in mind always that he's advocating ethical individuality. Why does loneliness inevitably attend modern individualism in his view? 
Okay, so loneliness, kodoku, in, as we say in Japanese, is one of the great themes of his uh, novels. And loneliness is a kind of symptom or a product of this uh, move away from the sort of community and the collective society that had um, been in place in Japan for centuries and uh, a move away from that toward uh, the modern individual self. And an inevitable, inexorable product of that is this loneliness that he mentions in this essay as well. And question number eight. Describe his view on capitalism. Right. So uh, some scholars have argued, and there's a book about it by Professor Bodau, again, that just came out a week ago or so, about uh, Soseki's critique of capitalism that runs through his works, his critique of the cult of property and so forth, um, of the influence of money on society. And I haven't read the book yet, but I w will order it immediately. But this is something that you notice when you read any of Natsume Soseki's works, that he's uh, r rigorously almost uh, criticizing modern capitalism and its effect on, its eroding effect on community, on society, and so forth. And uh, we get hints of that in this speech here. So describe his view, his critique of capitalism. And it's not a Marxist critique. It's more of a Confucian critique, right? It's coming at c capitalism, looking at it from the sensibility of somebody who grew up reading the Confucian classics, I think. So on the corrupting influence of power, of money, wealth, coercion, uh, which attend modern individualism, which come with modern individualism, what is he saying about these things in this speech? Discuss his view of the necessary balance or the unity, the necessary balance that must be struck between rights, freedom, liberty on one hand, and duties, responsibilities to the poor, especially on the other. Right? This is a central uh, component of his defense of ethical individualism, as he calls it. Is this uh, uh, speech a warning to the future ruling class audience, these kids that are about to take over Japan? Um, in positions of power? Is it a warning to them about how to treat the poor and the uh, less fortunate? How does his exhortation to become upstanding men of character, as he puts it, recall the Junza ideal of Confucianism, right? And there also seems to be influences of, of uh, doctrine of the mean, right? The Zhongyong, which we've read in this class, uh, in the way that Soseki in general shows, introduces to um, kind of polar opposites and aims for a middle path between them whenever he puts forth an argument. And you see that kind of doctrine of the mean influence running through his uh, novels as well, I think. Uh, why does he see the radical suffragettes? So he mentions the suffragettes in England who are uh, chaining themselves to walls and doing ki all kinds of crazy things uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. And he kind of comically describes them, these radical suffragettes, as an example of a modern emancipation project that fails to grasp this proper, to, proper unity, this proper Zhongyong balance, this doctrine of the mean balance between liberty and responsibility and duty, right? So he would say, I think, that these suffragettes shirk duty and responsibility and uh, sort of loyalty to community and the family and so forth, filial piety and all that, they they throw it away, all to, they abandon it altogether. And the final question, question number nine, discuss his nuanced remarks on nationalism, right, kokkashugi, as he calls it in Japanese, and of isms in general, right, so he talks about shugis in general, and the shugi, of course, is included in the title, adakushi no kojin shugi, so he kind of has a skeptical or ironic uh, view of all shugis, kojin shugi included. So discuss his nuanced remarks on nationalism and sh isms in general. What does he mean when he declares, we are in fact all of us nationalist and internationalist and individualists as well? What does he mean by that? What does he in why does he insist that individualistic morality is superior and loftier, as he puts it, than nationalistic morality? Okay, so he has a nuanced view view of things, a dialectical uh, kind of approach to these uh, various issues. But nevertheless, he uh, puts individualism above uh, nationalism. Why does he do that here? What aspects of modern Japanese society, culture, civilization does he criticize? Okay, for example, the imitation of Western intellectual fads. He takes a few pokes at that in this essay, or in the speech. Okay, so those are the nine questions I want you to consider as we read this article. 
Uh, not article, speech rather. Okay, so here's the speech. My individualism, Watakushi no Kojin Shugi by Natsume Soseki. And it's about 10 pages, so I'm going to read as quickly as possible so we get through it. Uh, and there, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, there are copious footnotes and annotations and explanations. And there's an excellent introduction that Professor Rubin provides at the beginning of this. You can read that on your own. I'm not going to read it here. Okay, Watakushi no Kojin Shugi. This is my first visit to Gakushu in. All right. I will mention Gakshuin founded in 1877 for the education of the new aristocracy, as I mentioned above, right? So these are this, the elite of the elites, right, that he's talking to in this speech. Um, this is my first visit to Gakshuin. I suppose I always imagined the campus would look like this, but I had no way of knowing for certain until today when I managed to gain entry for the first, very first time. And he lived uh, just down the street from this, right, uh, Gakshuin as did I for about 10 years. I lived about a five minute walk from the Gakushuin, it's a very beautiful u university. I think I already mentioned that. You can go visit it uh, next time you're in Tokyo. Um, I managed to gain entry for the first time. As Mr. Okada mentioned in his introduction, he originally asked me to speak to you last spring. I was unable to oblige him at the time. Exactly why Mr. Okada seems to remember better than I do myself, and I trust his explanation has been sufficient. In any case, I was forced to refuse. So he kept putting this off. Rather than simply return the invitation down, however, I volunteered to l deliver the next lecture in the series and learned that it was scheduled for October. After some calculating, I concluded that I ought to be able to get something together what with so many months left to go, and I accepted. Unfortunately, however, or perhaps fortunately, I became ill. So here's the first mention of his sickness, and he would die of his sickness three years later at the age of 50, and spent the entire month of September in bed. I was up I by October, it is true, but I was still too unsteady for lecturing. On the other hand, I could argue hardly ignore my promise and the thought that they were going to be after me any day now was a constant source of anxiety his first mention of his anxiety that he uh, felt all of his life soon the unsteadiness went away but the end of october came with no communication from gakshuin i had not sent word of my illness but a few of the newspapers had apparently carried the item which led me to the comforting belief that someone had realized the problem and given my lecture in given the lecture in my place. Then all of a sudden Mr. Okada showed up again in boots no less. Of course the fact that it was raining that day may have had something to do with it, but there he was, having trekked in his rain boots all the way to my house in Waseda to announce that the lecture had been postponed to the end of November at which time he hoped I would make good on my promise. Meanwhile, I had assumed that I had evaded, evaded my responsibility, and I was more than a little taken aback. By there, by there, but there was still over a month left, and I thought I should be able to manage something. Again, I agree, agreed to give a talk. Okay. So Waseda University, by the way, is about a 30-minute walk from Gakshuin. He's living near Waseda at the time. One would think that in the time from the spring to October or from the end of October to the 25th of November I could have found plenty of time to put together an organized lecture of some kind but I was not feeling right and just thinking about a talk became burdensome no I simply wouldn't bother with the thing until no November 25th I decided and let it go day after day at last with barely three days left to me I had a little twinge of feeling that I had better think of something to talk about, but that was still such an unpleasant prospect that I spent the day painting. Okay, so we're still in the introduction. It takes a while before he gets to his main point, so just bear with me, bear with Natsume Soseki as we get through these first few pages of introductory uh, matter. Now, please don't think that I really know how to paint. All right, so he spent the day painting. Don't think uh, that I know how to paint. I just dashed off this simple little thing, stuck it to the wall, and spent two or three days alone staring vacantly at what I'd done. Yesterday, I think it was, a friend came by and said he thought my picture was very good. No, not that the painting itself was good, but that it looked like something I must have done when I was in a very good mood. Right, so this kind of subjectivist emphasis of art is kind of hinted at here, right? An art, art work, a work of art is an uh, expression of the inner state of the, of the uh, artist. It's kind of East Asian uh, view of art, right, that he's drawing from. Uh, I told him that he was all wrong. I had done it not because I was feeling good, but because I was feeling bad. 
Okay, so this, there was a misreading of his subjective state, right? So uh, kind of comic inversion of the subjectivist view of uh, art here. And I went on to explain my mood to him. Just as there are those who turn their overflowing happiness into paintings or calligraphy or books, there are others who take up the brush to create painting or literature as a way to attain happiness when they are unhappy. And when we see the results that spring from these uh, two other very different psychological states, oddly enough, they are often identical. I won't go into any uh, deeper. I won't go any deeper into the subject. It is just something I thought I would mention, by the way, and has nothing to do with the main idea of my talk. At any rate, there I was, passing the time looking at this funny painting and doing nothing to put my lecture together. And so the 25th arrived today, the day I must appear here, whether I liked it or not. I spent some time this morning trying to organize my thoughts, but it seems that I am inadequately prepared. I must ask you to bear with me and not expect too much. Okay, so... It's. I think he mentions in a note somewhere that this is not wasn't much of a. Uh, he had notes for the general notes for this um, speech, but it it wasn't uh, fleshed out. And somebody actually uh, wrote down his speech as they listened and later published it, which is why we have it today. I do not know how long your club has been in existence. He's referring to the Hojinkai Club uh, at the university, but I see nothing wrong with your following the practice of bringing in outsiders and having them lecture. On the other hand, it does not seem to me that you are not likely to hear the sort of entertaining lectures you would like, no matter whom you bring in. I suspect that what interests you is the novelty of someone from the outside. Here is a, an ironic little tale I heard from a Rakugo storyteller. If you don't know what Rakugo is, look it up right now. Uh, the sort of uh, traditional raconteurs of uh, the Edo period in Japan, if they still exist today, storytellers. Once, two feudal lords were enjoying falconry near Meguro. After they had been galloping around for several hours, they became absolutely famished. But they had strayed away from their retainers, who carried the provisions. All they could do was demand food at a nearby peasant's shack. The old farmer and his wife broiled some mackerel and served this with barley, apologizing all the while for presenting such grand lords with the kind of crude fare they themselves had to always had to eat. The lords enjoyed the meal enormously, so much so that the aroma of the fish seemed to be lingering in their nostrils the next day, and they could hardly stop thinking about the wonderful flavor. One of the lords then invited the other for a mackerel dinner, much to the surprise of his retainers. There was no gainsaying the commands of the lord, however. The retainers ordered the cook to remove all the, of the mackerel's slender bones, marinate the fish in sweet sake, and roast it exactly so before serving it to the lord and his guest. This time, of course, the two men were not famished and the ridiculous care with which the cook had prepared this odd dish had long since expunged any flavor of mackerel. After a few perfunctory pokes with their chopsticks, the two lords looked at each other and said, If you want mackerel, you've got to go to Meguro. All right, and there's a note about this Dakugo anecdote in the text that you have. We'll review that later. As I see it, you're inviting me to speak to you. Your willingness to listen after having been kept waiting from spring to late autumn, despite the fact that you are at the excellent Gakshuin and in constant contact with excellent teachers, is exactly like the case of the two lords who, satiated with the finest delicacies, long to taste that me mackerel from Meguro. I see Professor Omori is here today. Professor Omori and I graduated from the university about the same time, Tokyo University is referring to, you know, the Imperial University, as it was called at the time. Uh, once, I remember, he complained to me that the students were not really listening to his lectures, that they were lacking in seriousness. He was genu genuinely upset. He was not talking about Gakshuin students, I believe, but students at a private college. In any case, my reply to him then was rather impolite. I am embarrassed to repeat it here, but I said to him, there's not a student anywhere in the world who would come running to hear your lectures. Professor Omori may have m misunderstood what I meant by that. So let me take this opportunity to correct any misunderstanding. When we were your age, or perhaps a little older, we were far less well-behaved than you. It would not be too much of an exaggeration to say that we never listened to lecturers. lectures. 
This is something I found when I uh, first attended Waseda University as a Tokovets Ken Kirin back in uh, 2005 or whenever. Uh, I would go into the university and all of the students in the uh, class, in the lecture hall, would be sleeping while the uh, professor would uh, talk away at um, endlessly. I speak from my own experience and observations, of course, and what I have to say may not apply to anyone outside my immediate acquaintance, but looking back now, I can't help thinking that this impression of mine is quite accurate. Certainly in my own case, I looked docile enough, but I was not the type to pay attention to lectures. I did nothing but loaf. Right, this uh, was the case that I, this same kind of situation I observed when I was at Waseda University. With memories like these, I can't find it in me to criticize the earnest young men I see in school today, and it was merely this idea that I sought to convey to Professor Olmori when I spoke to him so rashly. My purpose in coming here today was not to render an apology to Professor Olmori, but now, in your presence, let me take the opportunity to do so. Having strayed so far from the subject, I will now try to come back to it. Okay. Uh, you are all students at an excellent school under the constant guidance of excellent teachers whose lectures, both specialized and general, you attend every day. And I would imagine, as I said before, that you have bothered to bring me here for a talk, much as the two lords enjoyed the mackerel from Meguro. You want to take a bite of something new. But in fact, I am sure the lectures of the professors you see every day, the men employed by Gokshuing, are of far greater value and interest than anything I might have to say. You know as well as I do that... If I were a professor here, there would be there would not be so many of you in the audience today, and the enthusiasm and curiosity with which you are listening to me now would not have been forthcoming. I have bothered to mention this at all because, in fact, many years ago I tried to become a Gakshuin instructor. No, I did not come looking for a job. A friend of mine recommended here recommended me. Then I was the kind of dull-witted fellow who still did not know what he wanted to do to make a living right up to the moment of graduation. Once you go out into the world, of course, the rent money does not come in while you wait with folded arms. I had to find a position for myself. And so, without considering whether I was in fact qualified to become an educator, I did as my friend advised and began to maneuver for an opening here. There was a rival applicant, but my friend assured me that I had nothing to worry about. Deciding that I was good, as good as hired, I went so far as to ask him how instructors were in expected to dress. A mo morning coat would be essential, essential, he told me. So before anything was decided, I had myself fitted for a morning coat. This, mind you, I still had only the vaguest notion of where Gakshuin was located. Well, the coat was finished soon enough, but the hoped-for position did not come to me. The other man was chosen to fill the post of instructor of English. I can't seem to recall his name, probably because I was not especially chagrined at the loss, but apparently he had just come back from studying in America. If, by some fluke, fluke they had taken me instead of him, and if I had continued teaching here all these years, then I might never have received your courteous invitation or been given the opportunity to speak to you from on high like this. So had he been given the pos uh, position, he probably wouldn't have been the uh, great uh, writer of the major period that he uh, became. Indeed, look how long you have waited for me. This is itself proof that you see me as a delicious megaro macro only because I failed in my bid for a job here at Gokshu Inn. I would now like to say a little about what has happened to me since my failure to enter Gokshu Inn. Not simply because it follows logically on what I have been saying, but because it is an essential part of my talk today. I was turned down here, but I still had my morning coat, and I wore it because I had nothing else to wear. And where do you suppose I wore it to? Finding a job was a very simple matter in those days, unlike the situation today. There was a shortage of people, and you could be sure of finding a fair number of openings no matter where you looked. Even I had most, almost simultaneous offers from the first national higher school and the higher normal school. To the faculty member who was negotiating for me with the higher school, a former teacher of mine, I more or less said that I would accept their offer. Meanwhile, I was still saying non-committal non -committal things to the normal school. As a result, I got myself into a very difficult situation. I suppose this was just what I deserved for such youthful irresponsibility, but the fact remains that I felt terrible. Okay, so we, we already see this little hint of his migate, 
right? His uh, Kozin Sugi taking on, uh, his individualistic personality is uh, beginning to emerge uh, shortly after graduation, right? Uh, when he gives non committal answers to both of these uh, schools that he's applied to for, for, uh, for a job. The old higher school professor who was negotiating for me called me in and scolded me for putting him in such an awkward position. So he's fail failing to uh, consider the uh, feelings or the uh, situation of other others. With a foolishly short temper to match my youth, just like Bo his character Botjan in the novel Botjan, with a foolishly short temper to match my youth, I decided to turn down both offers, and I set about the business of doing so. But then a note arrived from President Kuhara of the higher school, asking me to come and see him. I hurried all over to find there the president of the normal school, Kano Jigo Jigoro, and my old higher school professor. Everything had been decided, they said. I need, f I need feel no obligation toward the higher school, but should take the normal school job. I had no choice but to accept the post. Secretly, however, I was greatly annoyed at the way things had turned out, for I did not think very highly of the normal school, an opinion I now, I know now to have been unjustified. I even attempted to convince Prince President Kano of my unworthiness. I insisted that I was unfit to teach at the normal school if what he had said was true, that as a teacher I must be a model for the students. So he's not a model for the students, right? a model of virtue. Um, but he went me one better. Hearing me decline with such simple honesty, he said, made him want me all the more. He refused to let me go, and so I ended up taking the job at the normal school. It had never crossed my mind to be so greedy as to hold both jobs at once, but in my immaturity I had managed nonetheless to cause everyone concerned a lot of needless difficulty. So now I had the job, but the fact was that I had never been qualified to make anything of myself as an educator, and at school I felt nervous and inferior. Perhaps I could have shirked my duties if I had been cleverer. Mr. Kano complained that I was too simple and honest, but I could not escape the feeling that I was in the wrong place. Quite frankly, I felt like a fishmonger working in a pastry shop. A year later, I finally went to work in a provincial middle school. This was in Matsuyama. I see this amuses you, right? So he says it amuses you because uh, his students giggle when he says this, and they giggle because they have all read Botjan, which had been serialized a few years earlier uh, in 1906. The yeah, 1906, right, and which describes his experiences in Matiyama. When I wrote Bocha, many people asked me who the model for the character named Red Shirt could have been. It so happens that I was the only one in Matsuyama Middle School at the time to have a university degree. So if you're going to look for uh, living models for each of the characters, then Red Shirt must be me, a cheering thought indeed. And he's being ironic here because there's a tendency in, uh, among the Japanese readership and the Japanese public to f look for models in all the characters that appear in uh, novels, right? And he's kind of making fun of that here. Um, I remained at Matsuyama for just one year. The prefectural governor ha asked me not to leave, but I had made an arrangement with another school, the Fifth National Higher School in Kumamoto. My teaching experience goes thus from middle to higher school, then on to the university. The only places in which I haven't taught are elementary school and girls' school. My stay in Kumamoto was a long one. Then suddenly, after I'd been there several years, a confidential inquiry came from the Ministry of Education, inviting me to go to England for a study. Okay, so now he goes to London and has this famous, terrible experience. At first, I thought of declining. After all, I reasoned. How would it serve the nation for someone like me, someone as egotistical as me, is the implication here, to go abroad with no clear-cut objective? But my superior, who had conveyed the ministry's inquiry, would have none of this. The ministry knows why it has chosen, chosen you, he said. There is no need for self-appraisal on your part. Just go. Having no good reason to refuse adamantly, I followed the government's orders and went to England. But sure enough, when I got there, I had nothing to do. So he's a loafer, he's an egoist, he's an individualist. A modern individualist is kind of out of place in uh, Japanese society. This requires some explanation for which I will have to say something about my life and experiences up to the time I went abroad. You may assume that we have come to an important 
part of today's talk. Okay, so now he gets into the main uh, subject of his talk. Uh, at the university, I majored in English literature. What exactly is English literature, you may well ask. I myself did not know the answer to that question after three years of furious study. Our instructor in those days was Professor Dixon. He would make us read poetry aloud, read prose passages to him, do composition. He would scold us for dropping articles, angrily ex explode when, when we mispronounce things. His exam questions were always of one kind. Give Wordsworth birth and death dates. Wordsworth's birth and death dates. Give the number of Shakespeare's folios. List the works of Scott in chronological order. Even as young as you are, surely you can see what I mean. Can this be English literature? Just a, a string of facts. Is this any way to instill an understanding of what literature is, English or otherwise? All right, you say, forge through on your own. But this is like the proverbial blind man peeking through the fence. Mekura no kaki nozoki in Japanese it's an expression. There's a footnote about that. I would wander about in the library searching for something that would give me a start, but there was nothing. This was not simply because I lacked motivation. The field was represented by the most meager collection of books. For three years I studied, and at the end, of the end I still did not know what literature is. This, I might say, was the source of my agony. Okay, so this kind of resonates with what I was saying in my talk yesterday for uh, YouTube, in which I mentioned how uh, I was a music studies, st uh, classical music student uh, for my first two years of university, and we studied music theory and uh, applied the things that we learned in music theory classes rigorously to various texts, right, to Beethoven sonatas, to Bach's uh, fugues and so forth, but then when I switched to a mi literature major, I found that nobody really knew how to talk about literature. Nobody could say what literature is. It was my experience too. A hundred years after um, Natsume Sosek, you felt the same thing in England back in 1903 uh, or whenever he was in England. Right? With this ambivalent attitude, I emerged from school to take my place in the world. I became, or rather was made into, a teacher. Right, so he didn't want to become a teacher, he just was kind of made it into a teacher, uh, which is something that he, that he did not enjoy so much, uh, which I can kind of relate to. Uh, questionable as my language ability was, I knew enough to get along and manage to squeak by each day. Deep inside, however, I knew only emptiness. Okay, underline emptiness, I have a question in the study guide about emptiness that he feels, right? Why does he feel, what is the source of this emptiness, this sense of uh, almost nihilistic emptiness? of meaninglessness. No, perhaps if it had been emptiness, I would have resigned myself more completely, but there was something continually bothering me. Okay, so it wasn't necessarily emptiness, it was some vague, disagreeable, half, half-formed thing that would not let me alone. Okay, so what is this thing? And this thing kind of has uh, resonances with the vague, disagreeable, half-formed thing that the narrator of uh, Kaji Motojiro's uh, Lemon, Lemon, feels in that famous opening line of that work, right? This vague, disagreeable, half-formed thing is something that seems to bother a lot of uh, modern Japanese writers of the late Meiji, uh, Taisho, and early Showa periods, right? So this is a very important passage or uh, sentence. To make matters worse, I felt not the slightest interest in my work as a teacher. I had not known from, I had known from the start that I was no educator, but I saw it was hopeless when just teaching English classes seemed like an enormous burden. I can relate to that. Uh, I was always in a crouch, reading to spring, ready to spring into my true calling, as soon as the slightest opening should present itself. Right, so he's waiting for his true calling, but this true calling of mine was something that seemed to be there, and at the same time was not there. No matter how, where I turned, I could not bring myself to make the plunge. Having been born into the world, I had to find something to do. But what that something was, I had no idea. So he's kind of a superfluous man, to use the uh, Russian uh, uh, archetype, to borrow the archetype from uh, Russian literature of the 19th century, the uh, I forget the Russian word for that, but he sees himself as a man with no purpose in the modern world, which is an archetype you see in a lot of uh, Japanese fiction of the Meiji period. I stood paralyzed, alone and shut in by a fog, 
hoping that a single ray of sunlight would shine through to me, hoping more that I could turn each searchlight outward and find a lighted path ahead, however narrow, but wherever I looked there was only obscurity, a formless blur. I felt as if I had been sealed in a sack, unable to escape. If only I had something sharp, I could tear a hole in the sack, I thought, struggling frantically, but no one handed me what I needed, nor could I find it for myself. There was nothing for me to do but spend day after day in a pall of gloom that I concealed from others, even as I kept asking myself, what will become of me? So he's having a kind of existen existential crisis, a breakdown. I graduated from the university, clutching this anxiety to my breast. It took with me, I took it with me to Matsuyama and from Matsuyama to Kumamoto, and when at last I journeyed to England, the anxiety was still there deep within me. Okay, so it's not that his experience in London uh, initiated this uh, or caused this anxiety. It was there from the beginning, it seems, with Natsumi. So again, it just got worse when he uh, upon arrival in london given the opportunity to study abroad anyone would feel some new sense of responsibility i worked hard i strove to accomplish something but none of the books i read helped me tear my way through the sack i could search from one end of london to the other i felt and never find what i needed i stayed in my room thinking how absurd this all was this famous uh uh, anecdote about how he was in London, spent the most of his most of his time in London, uh, cooped up in his room, not uh, interacting with other uh, humans. Kind of a hikikomori. Thinking of how absurd this all was. No amount of reading was going to fill this emptiness in the pit of my stomach, and when I resigned myself to the hopelessness of my task, I could no longer see any point to my reading books. It was then that I realized that my only hope for salvation, right, this is the, the important uh, sentence that I uh, have a question about in your study guide, my only hope for salvation, I realized, lay in fashioning for myself a conception of what literature is, working from the ground up and relying on nothing but my own efforts. At long last, it's a kind of philosophical project of uh, uh, exploring, uh, getting to the root of what literature is. At long last, I saw that I had been no better than a rootless, floating weed, drifting aimlessly and wholly dependent upon others, dependent in the sense of an imitator, a man who is someone, who has someone else drink his liquor for him, who asks the other fellow's opinion of it and makes that opinion his own without question. Right, so he gets the sense that his existence up to this point has been an inauthentic one. Yet it sounds foolish when I put it like this, and you may well doubt that there could be people who would imitate others in this manner, but in fact there are. Why do you think you hear so much about Bergson? He's talking about Henri Bergson these days, who was very popular in Japan at the time, or Yuken. Not sure who Uken is. Uken is not so influential these days or in the history of modern Japanese literature and thought, but Bergson is, uh, simply because Japanese see what is being talked about abroad and in imitation, they begin shouting about it at home. In my day, it was even worse. Attribute something, anything to a Westerner, and people would follow it blindly. Okay, so it was worse then, right, in the 1890s, early 1900s, uh, imitation of the West was rampant, and it kind of uh, peters out by the end of the Meiji period, and by the Taisho period, it's often said that Japan was thoroughly caught up to the West, so that it no longer felt the need, uh, whether in the cultural spheres or in politics or in uh, philosophy, to imitate the West as it had done during the Meiji period. This is sort of the background that you need to understand this section. Uh, in my day, it was even worse. Attribute something, anything to a Western, and people would follow it blindly, acting meanwhile as though it made them very important. Everywhere, there were men who thought themselves extremely clever because they could fill their speech with foreign names. Practically everyone was doing it. I say this not in condemnation of others, however. I myself was one of those men. I might read one European's critique of another European's book, for example, then, never considering the merits of the critique, without in fact understanding it, I would spout it as my own. This piece of mechanically acquired information, this alien thing that I had swallowed whole, that was neither possession nor blood nor flesh of mine, I would regurgitate it in the guise of personal opinion, and the times being what they were, everyone would applaud. 
Okay, but those days are over is the implication here. No amount of applause, however, could quiet my anxiety, for I myself knew that I was boasting of borrowed clothes, preening with glued-on peacock feathers. I began to see that I must abandon this empty display and move towards something more genuine, for until I did so, that anxiety in the pit of my stomach would never go away. A Westerner might say a poem was very fine, for example, or its tone extremely good, but this was his view, his Western view. And while certainly not irrelevant, it was nothing that I had to repeat if I could not agree with it. I was an independent Japanese, not a slave to England, and it was incumbent upon me as a Japanese to possess at least this degree of self-respect. A respect for honesty as well the ethics shared by all nations forbade me to alter my opinion. The fact remained, however, that as a specialist in English literature, it made me terribly uneasy to find that my ideas clashed with those of native English critics. Okay, this is the part, I have a question about this issue here, of uh, whether there's a universal ground to uh, culture and civilizations and literature that they all share, or whether each civilizational block is separate and uh, irreconcilable with the others. Right, so um, answer that question as we read this paragraph in the next few paragraphs. Uh, the fact remained, however, that a specialist in English literature made me terribly uneasy to find that my ideas clashed with those of native English criti critics. Right, So they're reading the same works of English literature, but they have fundamentally different uh, interpretations and analyses of these works. Why is that? He's asking himself. Whence, indeed, did this clash arise from difference in habits, in mores, in customs, Surely, if you traced it back far enough, national character was the source, kokumise, as the Japanese say. Right? Uh, but the usual scholar, confounding literature with science, mistakenly concludes that what pleases country A must of necessity win the admiration of country B. <sighs> this, I was forced to recognize, was where I had made a, my mistake. All right, then. Perhaps it was impossible to reconcile the contradiction between the English critic's views and my own. But if it could not be reconciled, at least it could be explained. And that explanation could cast a ray of light on the world of letters here. It so they have kind of fundamentally different Weltbild, Weltbilden, right? Pictures of the world is what he seems to be implying here. Different Dasein. Uh, it embarrasses me to confess that I was realizing such obvious things for the first time so late in life, but I have no intention of concealing the truth from you. My next step was to strengthen, perhaps I should say build anew, and this is the important uh, sentence, underline it, uh, it's uh, the answer to one of the questions I have in the study guide. My next step was to strengthen, or to build anew, the foundations on which I stood in my study of literature. For this, I began to read books that had nothing whatever to do with literature. Okay, this is something that every student of literature uh, discovers at one, some point in his studies, that uh, you can't learn about literature and you can't explain li literature simply by studying literature. You have to go elsewhere, namely uh, into philosophy, in order to make uh, sense and to uncover the sort of essence, underlying essence of the arts in general and literature in particular. If before I had been dependent on others, if I had been other-centered, it occurred to me now that I must become self-centered. Right, so he's going through a kind of Nietzschean phase where he must uh, uh, test things out for himself and discover the foundations of life and of culture and civilization and literature and art for himself. I became absorbed in scientific studies, philosophical speculation, anything that would support this position. Now the times are different, and the need for self-centeredness ought to be clear to anyone who has done a little thinking, but I was immature then, and the world around me still not very advanced. Okay, so back then, this kind of self-centeredness was still a rarity, right? But now in 1909, there is more of it. For example, Ioana Holme and these other the early naturalists who were very influenced by uh, Nietzsche and so forth. There was really no other way for me to proceed. Once I had gotten a grasp on this idea of self-centeredness, it became for me an enormous fund of strength. Suddenly, I found the courage to question others. Okay, so he's describing self-centeredness and egoism and individualism in very positive terms in this part of the speech. I had been feeling lost in a daze, 
when the idea of ego-centeredness told me where to stand, showed me the road I must take. So he's found a kind of uh, ground of being in this, uh, this uh, assertion of the ego. Self-centeredness came for me, became for me a new beginning. I confess, and it helped me to find what I thought would be my life's work. I resolved to write books, to tell people what they need, that they need not imitate Westerners, that running blindly after others as they were doing would only cause them great anxiety. If I could spell this out for them with unshakable proof, it would give me pleasure and make them happy as well. This is what I hoped to accomplish. My anxiety disappeared without a trace. So he's cured now after discovering this uh, egoism. I looked out on London's gloom with a happy heart. I felt that after years of agony, my pick had at last struck a vein of ore. A ray of light had broken through the fog and illuminated the way I must take. So he's had a kind of um, uh, an epiphany or an enlightenment experience. At the time that I experienced this enlightenment, I had been in England for more than a year. There was no hope of my accomplishing this task I had set for myself while I was in a foreign country. I decided to collect all the materials I could find and to complete my work after returning to Japan. As it chanced then, I would return to Japan with a strength I had not possessed when I left England, left for England. No sooner was I back in Japan, however, than I was obliged to chase around in order to make a living. I taught at the first national higher university in Tokyo. I taught at the university. Later, my income was still not enough to make, oh, make ends meet. I took another job with a private college. On top of all this, I came down with nervous exhaustion. Finally, I ended up having to write stories for magazines. Circumstances compelled me to give up my com contemplated task long before it was completed. My theory of literature, his Bungakurong, uh, is thus not so much a memorial to my projected life's work as its corpse, and a defamed, co a deformed corpse at that. Right, so his, his w major work of uh, literary theory of uh, sort of philosophical speculation about the essence of uh, literature is this work Bungakurong, but uh, he was unable to um, uh, complete it or to make it what he had ho intended it to be. It lies like the ruins of a city street that has been toppled by an earthquake in the midst of its construction. Okay, so these other demands, making money, getting by, making a living, got in the way and he wasn't able to make it the, although it's still an extremely successful work and well worth reading and perhaps we'll read it later in this semester. The idea that came to me at that time, however, was the idea of self-centeredness had stayed with me. Right, so he has this revelation, this epiphany, this um, enlightenment experience while he's in London, but then he comes back to Japan and he's immediately thrown back into a state of uh, despondency and gloom. Indeed, it has grown stronger with the passing of each year. My protect projected work ended in failure, but I found a belief that I could get my hands onto, the conviction that I was the master, while others were but my guests, right? This shu, kyaku, shu versus kyaku is kind of like the Hegelian uh, slave verse, uh, master versus slave dialectic that we see. So uh, he was the master, while others were but my uh, bondsmen, we might say, or guests. It's translated as here. This has given me enormous confidence and peace of mind, and I feel that it will continue making it possible for me to live. Right, so this discovery of e the ego, of his own egocentredness, uh, is what sustains him and ma allows him to get by in life. Otherwise, he would just be crushed by uh, the uh, demands of the day. Its strength may well be what has me standing up here lecturing to you, young men, like this. Okay, it's what allows him to be uh, authentic, right? And to uh, c what keeps him from falling into the mode of uh, dasman, to use uh, Heideggerian language. In my talk so far, I have tried to give you a rough idea of what my experience has been, my only motive being a sort of grandmotherly hope that it will be of some relevance to your own case. All of you will leave school and go out into the world. For many of you, that will not happen for some time yet. Others will be active in the real world before long, but I suspect that all of you are likely to repeat the agony perhaps a different kind of agony than I once experienced. 
There must be those among you who, as I once did, want desperately to break through to something but cannot, who want to get a firm hold on something but w meet with a maddeningly little success as you would in trying to grasp a slippery, hairless pate. Those of you who may have already carved out a way for yourselves are certainly the exception. There may be some of you who are satisfied to travel the old proven routes behind others. And I do not say you are wrong in doing so. Okay, so if you want to go, go the Dasman route, uh, that might that's okay too, if it gives you genuine, unshakable peace of mind and self-confidence. Okay, so not everybody can uh, choose the road of the uh, authentic life. If it does not, however, you must continue to dig ahead with your own very pick until you strike the vein of ore. I repeat, you must do it, for anyone who is unable to strike home will be unhappy for life, strained through the world in an endless, uneasy crouch. I urge you on so emphatically because I want to help you avoid this. I have absolutely no intention of suggesting that you take me as a model for emulation. So just as he didn't consider himself as a model of virtue when he first started teaching, uh, nor does he, uh, he doesn't consider himself a model for emulation today either. I know that I have succeeded in making my own way, and however unimpressive it may be appear to you, that is entirely a matter of your own observation and critical judgment. It does me no injury at all. I am satisfied with the way I have made, but let me be, let there be mo no misunderstanding. It may have given me confidence and peace of mind, but I do not for a moment believe that it can, for that reason, serve as a model for you. In any case, I would suspect that the kind of anguish I experience lies in store for many of you. And if indeed it does, then I hope you will see the necessity for men such as yourselves engaged in learning and education to forge ahead until you, until you collide with something, whether you must work at it for 10 years, 20 years, or a lifetime. I have found my way at last. I have struck home at last. Only when this exclamation echoes from the bottom of your heart will your heart find peace. And with that shout will arise within you an indestructible self-confidence. Perhaps a goodly number of you have already reached that stage, but if there are any of you now suffering the anguish of being trapped somewhere in the fog, I believe that you ought to forge ahead until you know that you have struck home, whatever the sacrifice. I urge you to accomplish this, not for the sake of the nation, nor even for the sake of your families, but because it is absolutely necessary for your own personal happiness." If you have already taken a, sim a route similar to mine, then what I have to say to you here, here will be of little use to you. But if there is something holding you back, you must press on until you have trampled it to dust. Of course, simply pressing on will not in itself reveal to you the direction you must take. All you can do is go forward until you collide with something. I do not mean to be standing up here preaching to you, but I cannot keep silent when I know that a part of your future happiness is at stake. I speak out because it seems to me that you would not, that you would hate it if you were always in some amorphous state of mind, if deep down inside you there were nothing but some half-formed, inconclusive, jellyfish sort of thing. If you insist that it does not bother you to feel like that, there is nothing I can say. If you insist that you have gone beyond such unhappiness, that is splendid too. It is everything I wish for you. But I myself am un was unable to go beyond it even after I had left school. Indeed, until I was over 30. It was, to be sure, a dull ache that afflicted me. But one that persisted year after year. That is why I want so badly for you, any of you who have caught the disease that I once had, to forge bravely onward. I ask you to do this because I believe that you will be able to find the place where you belong and you will attain the peace of mind and self-confidence to last a lifetime. This concludes the first part of my lecture. I shall now move into part two. All right, let's take a quick break here and then read the next second part of the lecture. All right get through this as quickly as possible. Gokshuin is generally thought of, and in fact is surely is, a school for young men of good social position. So as I mentioned at the outset, it's a school for the elite, uh, the new aristocracy. If, as I suspect, the sons of the upper classes gather here to the exclusion of the genuinely poor, then foremost among the many things that will accrue to you in years to come must be mentioned power. In other words, when you go out into the world, you will have a good deal more power at your disposal than a 
poor man would. Okay, so the first part of this essay was about the uh, the benefits or the merits of individualism, of egoism, and so forth. The second part is about the responsibilities, especially the responsibilities and the duties uh, that the uh, elite, the, the, aristoc the new aristocracy, must assume vis-a-vis -vis the uh, rest of the country. All right, so the focus here is on duties and responsibilities. And there's kind of a Confucian uh, tone that runs through this entire section. <coughs> I did say earlier that you must forge ahead in your work until you strike home in order to attain happiness and peace of mind. But what is it that brings that happiness and peace of mind? You make peace with yourself when the individuality with which you were born arrives where it belongs. And when you have settled on the track and moved steadily forward, that individuality of yours proceeds to grow and develop. Only when your individuality and your work are in perfect harmony can you claim to have found the place where you belong. With this understood, let us consider, consider what is meant by the word power. And I see it gives a, a meditations on power. Power in the new capitalist uh, Meiji Japan. The meaning of power is a tool by means of which one forces his individuality upon others. I hear echoes of Nietzsche there, the will to power. If this sounds too arbitrary, let us say that power can be used as such a tool. After power comes money. This too, and uh, again, uh, all of Natsume Soseki's um, works are about money and what it does to human relationships and the power of money and so forth. After power comes money. This too is something that you will have more of at your disposal than would a poor man. Viewed in the context in which I viewed power, money, financial power, can be ex an exceedingly useful tool for aggrandizing uh, uh, one's individuality through the temptation of others. Thus, we would have to characterize power and money as enormously convenient implements. For with them, one is able to impose his individuality on other men or entice them in any direction, as a poor man never could. A man with this kind of power seems very important. In fact, he is very dangerous. Right? So this kind of Confucian mourning of the, uh, the power of the, the merchant, of the wealthy man, of the capitalist. Early, earlier... I spoke primarily with reference to education, literature, and culture when I said that individuality could develop only when one has re reached the place where one belongs. But individuality functions in areas well beyond the confines of the liberal arts. I know two brothers. Here's another anecdote about two brothers, the younger of whom likes to stay at home reading while the elder is fanatically devoted to fishing. The elder is disgusted with his brother's reclusive ways, his habit of staying bottled up in the house all day long. He's decided that his brother has turned into a world-weary misanthrope because he doesn't go fishing, and he does all he can do to drag him along. The younger brother hates the idea, but the elder loads him down with fishing gear and demands his company to the pond. The younger grits his teeth and goes along, hoping he won't catch anything, but luck is against him. He spends the day pulling in these sickening fat carp. And what is the upshot of all this? Does the elder's plan work? Does the brother's personality change for the better? No, of course not. He ends up hating fishing all the more. We might say that fishing and the elder brother's personality are a perfect match. They fit together without the smallest gap in between. It is strictly a matter of his personality, however, and has nothing to do whatever with the brother's personality. What I have tried to do here is explain how power is used to coerce others. The elder's individuality oppresses the younger and forces him to go fishing against his will. Right? So the strong individuality crushes the smaller one. It's kind of um, social Darwinism in the background of this section. Granted, there are situations where such oppressive methods are unavoidable. In the classroom, say, or the army, or in the kind of dormitory that stresses military discipline, but all I have in mind in, in this instance is the situation that will prevail when you become independent and go out into the world. So then, let us suppose you are fortunate enough to collide with something you think is good, something you like, something that m matches your personality. You go on to develop your individuality, meanwhile forgetting the distinction between yourself and others. And you decide, so these are the dangers of egoism, the dangers of uh, individualism that he's discussing here. And you decide that you are going to get this fellow or that fellow into your camp, even if it means dragging him in. If you have power, then you end up with a strange relationship like that of the two bro brothers. 
If you have money, you spread it around, trying to make the other fellow over in your own image. Right? This tendency of mankind to uh, try to, this will to power, drive to uh, make others conform to uh, one's own vision of the world and to one's own image. You use the money as a tool of enticement and with its seductive power you try to change him into something that pleases you better. Either way, you are very dangerous. Okay, so this uh, desire to transform everything around you into instruments for your own use. And so it is that my desires on my ideas on the subject have come down to this. First, that you will be unhappy for life unless you press on to the point where you discover work that suits you perfectly and enables you to develop your individuality. Secondly, that if society is going to allow you such regard for your own individuality, it only makes sense for you to recognize the individuality of others and show a similar regard for their inclinations. To me, this seems not only necessary but proper. I think that it is wrong for you to blame the other fellow for facing left simply because you, by nature, face right. Of course, when it comes to complex questions of good and evil, right and wrong, some fairly detached examinations of the facts may be called for, but where no such questions are involved or where the questions are not particularly difficult, I can only believe that so long as others grant us liberty, we must grant equal liberty to them and treat them as equals. Okay, so the uh, issue of liberty appears here for the first time and I discusses liberty and its uh, 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 corollary of uh, duty and responsibility. There has been a good deal of talk about the ego and self-awareness, right? Jiga, the ego, self-awareness, jikaku, these days as a justification for unrestrained self-assertion. Underline unrestrained self-assertion, which I have in the study guide. This is something that's bad in his view. You ought to be on your guard against those who spout such nonsense. And again, I think he's referring to Iwano Hōme and some of the uh, naturalists who uh, are champions of the self and of pure unbridled uh, egoism, which he's criticizing here. For while they hold their own egos in the highest esteem, they make no allowance whatever for other people's egos. I firmly believe that if one possesses any sense of fairness, if one has any idea of justice, he must grant others the freedom to develop their individuality for the sake of their personal happiness, even as he secures it for himself. Unless we have a very good reason, he must, we must not be allowed to obstruct anyone from developing his individuality as he pleases for the sake of his own happiness. Right? So some of the idea of negative liberty here, right? the idea that you can have liberty as long as it doesn't encroach upon uh, the liberty of somebody else's, of somebody else. I speak of obstruction because many of you here will surely be in positions from which you can obstruct others some day. Many among you will be able to exploit your power and your money. Right? So he understands that these kids in his audience will eventually uh, belong to the exploiting class, right? And they will exploit the workers and extract from them there, uh, the surplus value and so forth. Properly speaking, there should be no such thing as power that is unaccompanied by obligation. As long as, so giddy, right? This is the part about duty, giddy, responsibility, obligation. As long as I reserve the right to stand up here looking down at you and keep you listening quietly to what I have to say for an hour or more, I ought to be saying something worthy of keeping you quiet. Right, so he's the master of the situation, standing above the students, demanding their attention, but as a uh, obligation, as his duty, he must give them something that is meaningful. Or at least, uh, if I'm going to bore you with a mediat mediocre talk like this one, I had better make certain that my manner and appearance have the integrity to command your respect. Oh, I suppose we could say that you have to behave yourselves because you are the host and I am the guests, but that is quite beside the point. It stops short at superficial etiquette, convention, and has nothing whatever to do with the spirit. Right, so spirit is superior to uh, superficial etiquette, li, convention. Sure. Uh, let me give you another example. I am certain that you all know what it is like to be scolded by your teachers. But if, there's, if there is in this world a teacher who does, not, who does nothing but scold, he is simply unqualified to teach. Right? can't be a master and just lord over uh, your subjects. You have to actually 
uh, take responsibility for them and uh, give them something that is uh, worthy and meaningful. A teacher who is going to scold must give himself entirely to his teaching, for a teacher who has the right to scold also has a duty to teach. So rights and duties uh, must come together, come in pairs. Teachers, as you know, make full use of the right they are given to maintain order and discipline, but there is a duty inseparable from that right. And if they do not discharge it, they cannot live up to the functions implicit in their profession. This holds true of money. As I see it, there should be no financially powerful man in this world who does not understand responsibility. Let me explain what I mean by this. Money is an exceptional. So here comes his critique of money and uh, its place in the new capitalist world. Money is an exceptionally handy thing to have around. It can be used for anything with the utmost flexibility. Let's say I make 100,000 yen on the stop stock market. With that money, I can buy a house. I can buy books. I can even have a good time in the pleasure quarters. Money can take any form at all. But I think you will agree when I say that the most frightening thing money can do is buy men's minds. This means throwing it down as bait and buying out a man's moral sense. So money, when he's talking about money's corrupting power, making it a tool to corrupt his soul. Now, assuming that the money I've made on the stock market can have a great ethical and moral impact, we would have to conclude that this is an improper application of money, or so it would seem. And yet this is how money functions. This is a fact that we must live with. The only way to prevent its corrupting the human heart is for those who possess money to have a sense of decency and to use their money wisely so that it will do no moral damage. And again, this is the theme of all of his novels, right? This corrupt corrupting uh, power that money has in this new world that we're living in now in the major period. This is why I say that money must always be accompanied by responsibility one must cultivate sufficient discrimination to appreciate the influence his money will have in any given situation, and one must manage his money as responsibility as his discrimination demands. To do less is to do wrong not only to the world at large, but to wrong oneself. Everything I've said thus far comes down to these three points. First, that if you want to carry out the development of your individuality, you must Here's a kind of summation of everything he said so far. So underline this paragraph, which is very important. First, if you want to carry out the devel development of your individuality, you must respect the individuality of others. Second, that if you intend to utilize the power in your possession, you must be fully cognizant of the duty that accompanies it. Third, that if you wish to demonstrate your financial power, you must respect its concomitant responsibilities. To put this another way, unless a man has attained some degree of ethical culture, there is no value in his developing his individuality. Underline ethical culture. So ethical culture, uh, individuality must uh, presuppose ethical culture. For without it, we have total chaos and nihilism and uh, the strong, the rich eating the poor. There is no value in his developing his individuality, no value in his using his power or wealth. Or yet again, in order for him to enjoy these privileges, it becomes necessary for him to submit to the control imposed by the character that ought to accompany them. When a man is devoid of character, everything he does presents a threat. When he seeks to develop his individuality without restraints, he obstructs others. When he attempts to use power, he merely abuses it. When he tries to use money, he corrupts society. Someday you will be in a position where you can do all of these things quite easily. That is why you must not fail to become upstanding men of character. Underline upstanding men of character and compare it to the idea of the Junza that we've discussed in our discussions, uh, in our lessons on uh, Confucianism, right? Let me change the subject for a moment. England, as you know, is a country that cherishes liberty. So back to the subject of liberty. There is not another country in the world that so cherishes liberty while maintaining the degree of order that Lin England does. I'm not very fond of England, to tell the truth. As much as I dislike the country, however, the fact that it, the fact is that no nation anywhere is so free and at the same time so very orderly. So England strikes a perfect balance in its view. There's uh, a perfect mean, a perfect dong yong. Japan can't compare with her. But the English are not merely free, they are taught from the time they are free to respect the freedom of others as they cherish their own. This uh, acknowledgement of not only one's own freedom, but the freedom of the other is what uh, keeps uh, England uh, a balance, balanced, peaceful, harmonious society, is what he's saying here. 
Freedom for them is never accompanied by the concept of duty, never unaccompanied by the concept of duty. So freedom and duty are conceived as a pair in England. Nelson's, Nelson, of course, is the great uh, uh, Navy captain. Nelson's, there's a big statue of Nelson, I think, at Trafalgar Square. Nelson's famous declaration, England expects every man to do his duty, was by no means limited to that particular wartime situation. It is a deep-rooted ideology that developed as an inseparable concomitant of liberty. They are like two sides of a single coin. When the English have some complaint, they often stage protest demonstrations. So now he talks about the suffragettes as a bad example of uh, of uh, political movement that seeks only liberty, but not uh, acknowledge uh, giving proper due to uh, responsibility and duty. They often stage protest demonstrations. The government, however, never interferes, but takes an attitude of silent disinterest. The demonstrators, meanwhile are fully appreciative of this, never engaged in reckless activities that will embarrass the government. We see headlines nowadays about suffragettes committing violence, but these women are an exception, because it's the one exception to his uh, characterization of England as a harmonious, peaceful uh, society that appreciates both liberty and duty. It might be objected that there are too many of them to be dismissed as an exception, but I think that but I think that is really the only way we can view them. I don't know what it is. They can't find husbands. They can't find jobs. It's kind of a trigger, uh, triggering, uh, it's a con uh, provocative statement that he's making here. We might have to uh, delete this from our class uh, lesson. They can't find husbands. They can't find jobs. Perhaps they are taking advantage of the long ingrained ethos of respect for women. But in any case, that is not the way the English have always behaved. Destroying famous paintings, going on hunger strikes in prison that make life miserable for their jailers, trying tying themselves to benches in Parliament and shouting to drown out the proceedings. Perhaps the women go through these unimaginable, unimaginable contortions because they know the men will employ restraint in dealing with them. All right, so Soseki is not a feminist, judging from this paragraph. Whatever their reasons, these women are an exception to the rule. In general, the English temperament cherishes liberty that does not depart from the concept of duty. I am not suggesting that we take England as a model. I simply believe that freedom without a sense of duty is not true freedom. For such self-indulgent freedom, okay, so true freedom versus self-indulgent freedom, makes a distinction between the two, cannot exist in society. And if for a moment it did, it would quickly be expelled, stamped out by others. I sincerely wish for all of you to be free. At the same time, I want to make very certain that you understand what is meant by duty. I believe in and practice individualism in this sense, and I do not hesitate to declare this before you now. There must be no un misunderstanding in what I mean by individualism. I ask your, un ask your undivided attention on this point, for it would be particularly unforgivable of me to instill misunderstanding in young men such as yourselves. Time is running short, so let me explain individualism as simply as I can. Individual liberty is indispensable for the development of individuality that I spoke of early, and the development of individuality will have a great bearing on your happiness. Thus it would seem to me that we must keep for ourselves and grant to others a degree of liberty such that I can turn left while you turn right, each of us equally unhindered, so long as what we do has no effect on others. This is what I meant when I spoke of individualism. This is what I mean when I speak of individualism. The same is true of power and money. He's kind of recapitulating his earlier points here. What will happen if people abuse these things? Which again shows that he's speaking to a group of kids, right? If you're speaking to adult intellectuals, he wouldn't have to repeat himself as he does, but he's uh, talking to students, so he uh, recapitulates here. What will happen if uh, people abuse these things, if they exploit their wealth and power to attack men who have done nothing worse than be to be disliked by them? This will surely destroy individuality and give rise to human misery. For example, what if the police commissioner had his men surround my house for no better reason than the government did not take a fancy to me? The commissioner may actually have that much power, but decency will not permit him to use it in that manner. Or again, what if one of the great magnates, Mitsui, this is the Zaibatsu, the Mitsui of Mitsui Mitsubishi, say, or Iwasaki, another great Zaibatsu of the Meiji period that still exists today, I think, uh, were to bribe our maid 
and have her oppose me in everything. If there were the slightest bit of what we call character behind their money, it would never occur to them to commit such an injustice. All such evils arise because people like that are incapable of understanding ethical individualism, underline this, ethical individualism, good individualism, individualism, uh, individualism as opposed to self-indulgent individualism. They try instead to aggrandize themselves at the expense of the general public to use their power, be it financial or otherwise, to further their own selfish ends. Thus it is that individualism, the individualism that I'm describing here, in no way resembles the danger to the nation that ordinary people imagine it to be. As I see it, individualism advocates respecting the existence of others at the same time that one respects one's own existence. I find that a most worthy philosophy. More simply stated, individualism is a philosophy that replaces cliqueism with values b based on personal judgment of right and wrong. Okay, so it replaces cliqueism, which uh, characterizes feudal society, right? The various habatze, all kind of with their allegiances to uh, various cliques, uh, and without with reason and rationality not being so important to them. That is replaced uh, in the modern period with uh, individualism, which is based on personal judgment of right and wrong. Right, this kind of enlightenment view of reason um, advancing humanity beyond the feudal cliques. An individualist is not forever running with the group, forming cliques that thrash around br blindly in the interests of power and money. That is why there lurks beneath the surface of his philosophy a loneliness unknown to the others to others right so the the true individualist the good ethical individualist is willing to stand against the mob when he knows that he is uh, by using his faculty of reason when he knows that he is right and the mob is wrong so loneliness inevitably accompanies uh, the true individualist and we have a question about this issue on the study guide as soon as we deny our little groups, then I simply go my own way, and I let the other man go his unhindered. Sometimes, in some instances, we cannot avoid being scattered. That is what is lonely. Back when I was in charge of the literary column at the Asahi Shimbun, so you remember that many of his uh, major novels uh, were first serialized in the Asahi Shimbun, we ran an article with an unflattering remark ab about Miyake Setsurde. And there's a note about Miyake Setsurde. I think he was one of the major uh, sort of super ultra nationalists of the late Meiji, early Taisho period. Right, so they wrote an unflattering remark about Miyake Setsurde. It was a critical commentary, of course, not a political or uh, personal attack. And it consisted of a mere line or two. I don't remember exactly when it came out, perhaps when I was sick, uh, or possibly I was the one who gave the go ahead. Uh, go ahead. But in any case, this bit of criticism appeared in the Asahi Literate column, which made them very angry over at Setsure's magazine, Nihon Oyobi Nihonjing. This is a uh, kind of ultra nationalist magazine that he was running. They didn't deal directly with me, but approached a subordinate of mine demanding a retraction. Setsure himself, of course, had nothing to do with this. It was his uh, followers, uh, his blind followers, that. Uh, insisted that they uh, take the piece down or retract it. It was something that a few of his henchmen took it upon him themselves to do. Perhaps I should call them his colleagues. Henchmen makes him sound like a bunch of thugs. And of course, he's being uh, comical here. They were a bunch of thugs in many regards. Well, these colleagues of his insisted on a retraction. We would have been happy to oblige them, of course, if it had been a question of factual error, but this was a critique after all, and there was nothing we could do but insist on our right to publish what we wanted. Their demand was surprising enough in itself, but then some of these men at Nihon Oyobi Nihonjing started writing negative things about me in every issue, which truly came as a shock. I never dealt with them directly, but when I heard what was going on, it made me feel very odd, for while I was acting out of individualism, they seemed to be functioning strictly as a clique. Okay, So as an individualist, Natsume Soseki is uh, acting according to reason and rationality and a uh, sense of justice and right and wrong and so forth, whereas these, uh, this ultra-nationalist faction S merely functions as a mob, as a clique. At times, uh, this kind of reminds me of the uh, discourse that we've seen in the past year over the corona I issue, right? The, with the scientific community, the majority of them, uh, kind of following the money and doing what the um, 
their uh, sponsors and their bosses tell them to, to say and what the media s tells them to say, uh, while a small group of uh, free-thinking uh, scientists have formed their own kind of uh, dissenting faction. Um, at times, I had gone as far as to publish negative reviews of my own novels in the literary column that I m myself controlled, so it shocked me and made me feel very, very strange to see these colleagues of Setsure angered by a little c criticism. I know this will sound disrespectful, but I could not help feeling that they were living in the wrong century. They were like something out of the feudal age. Right? So cliqueism is a feudal remnant, is what he's saying here. But even as I concluded this of Setsure's men, I myself could not deny a certain sense of loneliness. Differences of opinion, I know, are bound to arise between the closest of friends. That is why I may have given advice to the many young men who frequent my home, but have never, unless for some other substantial reason, tried to keep any of them from expressing their views. I acknowledge the existence of others. I grant them this degree of freedom. Okay, so this is... Uh, one of the uh, best aspects of modernity of, of European enlightenment, this idea that uh, of free speech and the ability to uh, have conversations and dialogue with others and disagree with them without having uh, wars break out, right? And he takes this aspect of modernity and praises it, right? So uh, as we discussed in our lesson on Yume Juya, there are uh, um, Natsume Soseki's general attitude toward modernity is very ambivalent. There's some aspects of it that he praises and is in favor of, of such as this uh, idea of free speech, and other aspects that he's very critical of. And we see the same kind of ambiguity and this uh, nuance and this kind of dialectical position about these issues that he takes here in this uh, speech as well. I grant them this degree of freedom. But thus I can never hope for another man to support me against his will, however wronged by someone I may feel. Herein lies the loneliness of individualism. Underline loneliness of individualism. Before he will take a stand based on what others are doing, the individualist chooses a course of action based on the merits of the case. Sometimes as a result he will find himself quite alone. I cannot do but to do what is the famous line from Martin Luther? I can't remember. Um, all right, let's get through this. He will miss the comfort of having allies, and that is as it should be. Even matchsticks feel secure in a bundle. I would like to add just another word to prevent any misunderstanding. We're almost done. Many people seem to think of individualism as something opposed to, even destructive of, nationalism. So now he turns to the question of nationalism, and again his view is very nuanced and it uh, requires some unpacking. But individualism in no way justifies such a misguided, illogical interpretation. Actually, I don't like these labels that I have been using. People are not to be neatly defined by any single ism. For clarity's sake, however, I am forced to discuss a variety of things under the one heading. Okay, so we have a question about his attitude toward nationalism and in isms in general in your study guide, so uh, keep that in mind as we read this uh, these next few paragraphs. Some people nowadays are spreading the idea, and they believe it, that Japan cannot survive unless she is entirely nationalistic. Many of them go as far as to assert that our nation will not will perish unless this terrible individualism is stamped out. What utter nonsense! We are, in fact, all of us nationalists and internationalists and individualists as well. So we can be all, th all three at once, nationalists, internationalists, and individualists. Freedom is the essential substance of individualism, which in turn forms the foundation of individual happiness. Each man's share of freedom, however, rises and falls like a thermometer in accordance with the relative security or insecurity of the nation. This is not so much an abstract theory as a generalization determined by the facts. It is the way things happen in the natural course of events. The individual's liberty contracts when the country is threatened and expands when the country is at peace. So these are all interrelated, is what he's saying. We shouldn't think of them separate. Separately, uh, This is all very obvious. No man of character is going to aim solely at the development of his individuality when the very survival of the nation is at stake. On the other hand, to be, uh, do be sure you see that the individualism I'm talking about 
implies a warning against becoming the kind of fellow who insists on keeping his helmet on even after the fire is out, the man who wants to keep in lockstep when that is no longer necessary. Here is another example. When I was in higher school, some of the students organized a club. I've forgotten now what they called it and just uh, what it aims, its aims were, but it was a particularly severe advocate of nationalism. There was nothing wrong with this club, of course. It had plenty of support, including that of student president Kinoshita Hirotsuge. All the members wore badges on their chests. I did not intend to wear any badges, but I was made a member nonetheless. Not being one of the club's originators, I knew that many of my opinions were at odds with theirs, but I joined since I had no reason, good reason not to. When it came time for the inaugural meeting in the big lecture hall, one of the students appear, apparently decided that the occasion deserved a speech. I was, to be sure, a member of the club, but there was s much in it that conflicted with my opinions, and I recall having strongly attacked its aims. But here, at the opening meeting, everything this fellow had to say was a rebuttal of what I had said. I had no idea if he was go doing it on purpose or by coincidence, but in any case, I was going to have to answer him. And without, When he was through, I stepped up to the podium. I suppose I handled myself very badly, but it, at least I said what was on my mind. My remarks were quite simple, and they went something like this. The nation may well be important, but we cannot possibly concern ourselves with the nation from morning to night as though possessed by it. There may be those who insist that we think of nothing but the nation 24 hours a day, but in fact no one can go on thinking about one single thing as incessantly as that. The bean curd seller does not go around selling bean curd for the nation's sake. He does it to earn a living. Whatever his immediate motives may be, he does contribute something to s necessary to society, and in that sense, perhaps the nation benefits indirectly. The same might be said of the fact that I had three bowls of rice today for lunch and four for supper. I took a larger serving, not for the nation's sake, but frankly to suit my stomach. These things might be said to have some very indirect influence on the country, and indeed, from certain points of view, they might bear some relation to the entire dra drift of world affairs. But what a horror if we had to take them in that into account and eat for the nation, wash our faces for the nation, go to toilet for the nation. There is nothing wrong with encouraging nationalism, but to pretend that you are doing s all of these impossible things for the nation is simply a lie. This is more or less what I said. said. No one, and I do mean no one, is going to be unconcerned about the nation's safety when the country is in danger. But when the country is strong and the risk of war is small, when there is no threat of being attacked from without, then nationalism ought to diminish accordingly and in individualism enter to fill the vacuum. This only stands to reason. We are all aware that Japan now today is not entirely secure. Japan is a poor country and small. Who knows what could happen or when? In that sense, all of us must maintain our concern for the nation. Japan was not small, of course, uh, at this time. It uh, just defeated Russia uh, five years ago, the uh, the Russian Empire five years ago, and was now uh, a, a burgeoning empire. So he's kind of downplaying Japan's role in the world uh, here in this section. Um, in that sense, all of us must maintain our concern for the nation. But this country of ours is in no danger of suddenly collapsing. We are not about to suffer annihilation. And as long as this is true, there should be no need for all the commo commotion on behalf of the country. It is like running through the streets dressed in firefighting clothes and full of self-sacrifice before any fire has broken out. Finally, however, this is all a matter of degree. When war does break out, when a crisis involving the survival of the nation does arise, anyone with a mind that can think, anyone who has cultivated sin sufficient character such that he cannot help but think, will naturally turn his attention to it. Nature itself will see to it that he gives his all for the nation, even if it means putting restrictions on his individual liberty and cutting back on personal activity. Thus, I do not for a moment believe that nationalism and individualism are irreconcilable opposites sits engaged in a constant state of internecine warfare. Okay, on the on the contrary, he uh, suggests here, nationalism and individualism can coexist, is his point. I would like to say more on the subject, but time does not permit, so I will limit myself to these remarks. There's just one other thing that I would like to bring to your attention, namely that a nationalistic morality comes out of a very poor second comes out a very poor second when compared with an individualistic morality. 
So individualistic morality is superior to nationalistic morality is his claim here. Nations have always been most punctilious over the niceties of diplomatic language, but not so with the morality of their actions. Right. So um, nations behave atrociously more often than uh, individuals behave atrociously is his claim here, and which is a, a, a demonstrably true uh, historical fact as well, you could say. They swindle and cheat and trick each other every chaotic step of the way. Murder each other, you could add there to his list. That is why you are going to have to content yourself with a pretty cheap grade of morality when you take the nation as your standard, when you conceive of the nation as an indivisible monolith. Okay, so nations behave more barbarously than uh, individuals do. Uh, approach things from a foundation of individualism, however... So this is the Eng the Englishman in him talking. And you arrive at a far more lofty morality. The difference between the two deserves a good deal of thought. To me, therefore, it seems obvious that in a time of tranquility for the nation, we ought to give the nation greater stress to individualism. We ought to give the greater stress to individualism with its lofty moral sense. I will not have time to say any more on this subject today. I want to thank you for inviting me here. I have tried my best to explain to you how necessary individualism will be for young men such as yourselves who will have the opportunity to live lives of individual fulfillment. And I have done so in the hope that it might be of use to you once you have gone out into the world. Whether or not I have in fact made myself understood, I of course cannot know. But if there should be points that are still unclear to you, it is because I have expressed myself insufficiently and poorly. If you do find that I have left anything, something vague, please do not assign some random meaning to my words, but come to see me at home whenever you wish, and I will do my best to explain. So famously, uh, Natsume Sosaki, uh, the last few years of his life, he spent much of his time in his living room at home and taking uh, guests, including uh, many students who would come and have literary discussions with him. Of course, and he wrote about these uh, encounters in works such as uh, Garasu no Nantoka, what's it called? Garasu do no Naka, Inside the Glass Door. Um, best to explain. Of course, nothing could give me greater satisfaction than to have gained your understanding of my true meaning without this extra effort. And now I shall step down lest I overstay my welcome. And that is the end of Watakshi no Kojin Shugi, the famous speech given uh, by Natsumi Soseki to the young uh, new aristocracy member uh, class uh, students at Gakshuin uh, Peers College in 1909, I think I said it was, 1914, sorry. All right, that is the end. If you have any questions, uh, we will discuss, you can ask them in class when we discuss this work in further detail. Uh, goodbye.